I have a feeling that your son is about to be really disappointed in how badly I played this game. I just want you to know that. Like, I know Than is halfway competent. At this game? Yeah. I used to be, um, I don't know if I told you this, or if you guys remember this game, but I, um, hold on, the stream started in the middle of me trying to talk to you guys. Hello, everybody! Hey, everybody. Welcome to Exploring hey. Reality! Um, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, I got a bunch of friends here today. We're just gonna play some Warzone, have some fun, talk theology, philosophy, apologetics. Um, and before we get into everything, just a friendly reminder, we're trying to push to try to get Exploring Reality fully funded, so that way I can do this kind of stuff full-time for you guys, get you guys the academic content and the pop-level content. Um, you can be get better content to you as well. Um, and now finishing what I was just going to say before you guys introduce yourself, because you might think it's funny. Uh, if you remember the game Destiny, I I, uh, I was in one of the top 1% Twitch streamers Whoa. in the world for that game in PvP. <laughs> casually so, flexing right yeah, as the stream yeah. starts off, Amazing. just casually. I was like, yeah, yeah. so. I mean, All right. Well, we got everybody rolling. Um, guys, why don't you just like, go around and introduce yourselves really quick, um, and then we'll get started playing the game. I'm uh, in Philosopher's Garb. I am a uh, dirty TikTok apologist, and I just want to say how honored I am to be here with the people who are important enough to be mentioned in the title of this live stream. I think that's really cool for you guys. So honored to be here with you. Man. I took my head off. I don't know what he said. <laughs> you didn't hear it? He just slammed you for not including his name in the title of this video. <laughs> it would have been too long. <laughs> yeah. All right. My name is Matt. Uh, the meme lord for the Lord. I run memes for Jesus, and I also have a podcast called Meme Lord Monday. And I am probably the oldest person here, uh, even though I look like I'm 18. <clears throat> <laughs> and yeah, that's me. Well, I am the second oldest person here, I imagine. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Tyler McNabb, so I, uh, I run um, a professor of philosophy at St. Francis University. <laughs> 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 so I'm a philosopher, but I, I like to game. I'm pretty mid, but uh, uh, my son will be joining us the first round at least, and uh, just I like to pretend that I'm him sometimes, so he's the prophet. So. Nice. I'm How old are you, Ty Tyler? <laughs> I'll be 34 in about a week. Okay, yeah, you're, you're the second oldest. I just turned 30. Nice. Um, chat, go ahead and ask your questions. I'll pull it up. I'll pull them up um, and while I get whenever I get the chance, um, and we'll just kind of chill, play some video games, and have a good time. And um, you won't hear me screaming like a girl, like I w you heard me last time when James and I played that horror game. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, it was fun. My right. eyes hurt afterwards, but it Did was it? fun. Did, uh, yeah, my eyes hurt for like the rest of the night. Somebody actually, uh, I did ask a question, but it's not a philosophical one. Um, said, let's go. Don't need and hey, if you're still debating Matt, when will that be? Um, so for context, for anybody that doesn't know, um, I have a formal in-person debate with Matt Delahunty um, mm -hmm. on Good Friday on the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so it'll be on Good Friday. It'll be in Tampa, Florida. Um, and it's not a ticketed event. So if you guys want to go to the beach with the Bayesian Mahaler, Tell me more. <laughs> I, didn't know. I didn't know that was a thing. What? Are you doing a raffle? I can get to go to the go to the beach with the, the Beijing brawler. I there subscribe. I get a chance to win. Matt uh, Tyler, for context, um, uh, in thought, James asked ChatGPT to write a story about me, and ChatGPT in the story gave me the nickname of the Beijing brawler. I like it. I like it. <laughs> it's been stuck ever since. That's his alter ego now. I like it. That's good. All right. Um, so. Daisy uh, and Baller and properly basic. Yeah. Let's, let's go. Um, so full disclosure, Tyler. I'm, I'm a really bricks. aggressive player when I play Real this game. Soon. Somebody uh, said audio very yeah, low. Yeah, what audio is low? Is it the game audio or what? Because if it's the game audio, I can turn it up. <laughs> <clears throat> Enemy soldier incoming. I'm assuming they're talking about my game audio, which I can 
guys want to drop? Where are we dropping, boys? Where are we dropping, boys? That's what you have to ask. I'll just follow y'all. You want to tell your son to mark something? Yeah, go ahead and mark wherever, and he'll follow. Okay, cool. Let's drop somewhere peaceful. Get a little warm up. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Somebody in the chat asked Tyler, what's your the worst paper that you've ever written and why was it on classical? Ah! Uh, oh, shoot. My joke. Someone's got jokes. <laughs> Jeez, bro. He's being cold. Out the gate. Well, my work on classical theism is bad. In fact, I'd say the worst paper. I ever wrote was on Molinism. Really? Oh yeah. What was it about? Like, what was the what was the title? It um. I don't remember the titles of my papers. Uh, some something about <laughs> Super Mario Strikes Back. That's probably my worst one. Oh, no, 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 no. I just got roasted because I was uh. I was focusing on Tyler. I was give yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you where do you land the plane on uh, divine fire? Yeah, so um, I have a much more updated view on my sort of views on this thing. And, oh, are you uh, about to announce to everyone to the wall that you're an open PS over there? No, no. <laughs> I am Catholic, sir. I know. I'm at the <laughs> What's your views? <laughs> yeah, no. So I'm a Mysterian. Um, so I have a paper with Mike DeVito where we argue for. Um, a Mysterian view, so we have independent warrant for thinking that um, God has exhausted foreknowledge, and we have independent warrant for thinking that we have libertarian freedom, and uh, how are these consistent? Well, these aren't really consistent if we're going to think about God as having foreign, uh, having knowledge in the sort of way that we have knowledge. That's not compatible. Where's everyone at? But I am, yeah, I am fixing... Okay. Um, but if God has, say, knowledge two, instead of, say, knowledge one, that we have knowledge one, then perhaps whatever is at odds with having our knowledge and with freedom is not the case when it comes to God, since he has, like, knowledge two, or knowledge two, if that makes sense. Yeah, so really quick for the <sighs> for people that might not know, what what is the difference between foreknowledge one and foreknowledge two? Yeah, well, so foreknowledge one would just be kind of like when we normally would utilize when we talk about foreknowledge, right? Uh, uh, you know, so like I know the future, um, or I know that this will happen, right? Um, and then uh, foreknowledge two is like God has something like that, but it's not exactly that. I'm gonna land with my son. Oh, oh gosh, me. I'm getting charged. Oh, oh, dang! I died already. No, I didn't. Son, save me! No, nope, son, save me. James, you're playing, right? Uh, playing is a strong war for what I'm doing. Right now. <laughs> let, let me let me moderate the chat. Oh here. gosh, dude. Um, I mean, I'm I'm just for Tyler. Alert, but... Yeah, somebody's got a question, Carl. I was gonna pull it up. Uh, for Tyler. Oh, okay. Uh, what is the best argument against reformed epistemology? Oh, that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> the base. <laughs> well, the last part of that question I actually, was, I actually don't even have a... I actually don't even... Yeah, yeah, they also asked why is it wrong. But I actually don't have an opinion on reformed system. I just haven't looked into it enough. Yeah, well, you should read Tyler McNabb, Religious Epistemology, Cambridge uh, Element book there. It's on you my should, reading list. You should totally read that. I have the PDF and, uh, and everything. Yeah, I, I really don't think that there are good objections. So this is like one thing that's not um, that the 
apologetics community doesn't necessarily reflect the philosophical community. Yeah. Where um, vast majority of Someone philosophers are either externalists or some sort of like soft internalist. And especially if we're talking about warrant, then we're talking about external. Um, and so like things like classical foundationalism, just that's like hardly exists in the academic philosophical world. Yeah. So like when people, like I have friends who are atheist philosophers, um, they are, um, uh, they would be fine with calling themselves reformed epistemologists. Ah. Um, it's hard to play this game and do this at the same time. Uh, it's, uh, they would call themselves reformed epistemologists, even though they don't believe in God. But just because they think, like, yeah, it's, like, really epistemically, like, permissive in reference to, like, what basic beliefs are. Awesome. Oh. Next question, also for Tyler, or I guess anyone else. Does reformed epistemology and reformed theology go hand in hand? I would, no. I mean, go ahead. I was just going to say no, at least not necessarily, but it sounds like maybe you have, we were going to have a different answer. Well, we we'll got back. killed. It's okay. That Dan, was I think your mic match. is a little low. What? I think your mic is a little low. Mine is? Yeah, either that or you were just really far from it. My son came there in we go. bragging that he at least got six kills. So, oh. just to make me and uh, and James feel better. I uh, I will do better next time. I'm just not even going to talk, and I'm just going to focus on getting kills. I'll tell you one. That's the thing about being bad is even if I'm talking, I can't possibly be worse than I already am. <laughs> um, so I might as well... Matt, you okay with staking out one more match so we can get so we can Yeah, we yeah, dude, I'm loving, okay. I'm loving doing the chat. Oh, Elijah, you got one more time. <laughs> yeah, I like that. We Tyler, have Tyler, 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 he can play as long as he wants, man. I'm, I, I don't, no, just... I'm having more fun just hanging. <laughs> <laughs> I like that we have like me level four, fan level ninety four, Tyler one hundred and sixty four. <laughs> yeah, that's my then, son. Yeah. Not mine. <laughs> I don't know the problem. Tyler, do you have anything to say on the reformed epistemology and reformed theology thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Plantinga calls it um, reformed epistemology primarily because he found inspiration in Calvin's uh, uh, book one of his institutes, where Calvin talks about a sensus divinitatis, a sense of divinity where he interprets Calvin, whether rightly or wrongly, as talking about some sort of kind of innate faculty within the human mind that's able to make us become aware of God. Um, he ends up later on regretting calling it reformed epistemology. Um, even Plantinga, though, like he tries to draw from Aquinas um, and so forth. So it's, it's not it's not a reformed view per se. It fits well with the reformed tradition for sure. Um, but I think for example, in Aquinas, specifically um, in his questions, the quad libitils, um, I think there's like really strong reason to think that Aquinas endorses the thesis of foreign epistemology. All the thesis is, is simply that religious belief can have positive epistemic status, right? It can be justified or warranted apart from argumentation. Uh, Bergman in um, the co-edited volume that I have recently with um, John Greco and uh, Jonathan Fuquay, uh, Bergman likes to characterize it as an anti-inferentialist thesis, uh, where um, you're saying that religious belief can be justified or warranted apart from some sort of inference. Heck yeah. All right. Sam Bradley asks, um, are you still, re Tyler, are you still reading HMK Damascene's book, Christ slash how? Uh, I read a good portion of it and I've stopped. So I'm on to different books. Usually I'll read like the most interesting chapters of a book. And then if I, if I sort of lose a little interest, I'll hop, I'll hop on to another book. What did you think of it? Uh, I was really interested to hear your thoughts on it after. Yeah, no, I really liked it. Um, I mean, I thought um, uh, his take on, on, on Taoism is actually right. So um, Eric Baldwin and I have a chapter 
in that new classical theism volume that came out with Robert Kuhn's editing and John Pico editing, um, where we argue that uh, Taoism can be ter interpreted in a way that's uh, consistent with classical theism. In fact, I think maybe even like entails classical theism. But um, yeah, so I, I really did like that. I thought it was creative. It was kind of like a track almost um, to give someone who's interested in Taoism to sh show them that they don't have to necessarily ditch uh, their framework, so to speak, um, that Christ really is the fulfillment of that framework. And that's kind of a lot of the work that I try to do with Buddhism and, and Confucianism and, and, and some other traditions. And so I, I was a fan of that approach. Um, yeah, um, I actually don't play Warzone a whole lot. I usually just play like Team Deathmatch or Gunfight or, um, yeah, just kind of like that. Where are we landing, by the way? I yeah. definitely think Warzone 2 was better than Warzone 3. I think uh, Warzone 3 was like kind of a step backwards. Like a lot of the changes that they made to the balance and the guns and everything, I understood where they were coming from, but I just feel like it kind of took some of the flavor and some of the like smoothness from the game away. <laughs> I'm 100% BS. Uh, I actually like Warzone 3 Yeah, the movement is better on Warzone 3, I think. We've only played this game two times, so... I agree. Yeah, people are saying your mic is a little low fan still. Mine still? My mic, yeah. my, I don't know what what's going on, but my mic just keeps on, like, doing this thing where it's lowering its volume on its own. Oh, gosh. Is it doing that? Other times too? No, this is the only time it's been doing it. I think it's just, it just might be fine. Yeah, there's a guy on there. There's a guy on that room over there Wait, camping on this room. Oh, this room right here? This one, one. Yeah, he's to the right. Oh, dang, he's yeah, got a missile like on uh, uh, <laughs> well, I'm dead. Got I got you down. I have like a 41. Way better. Are they still in there? Oh god, oh god! I'm gonna take that away from you. I've got two kills so far. Is that guy still in there? You need to get a better gun as well. Things are on the roof. Tyler, what led you to getting into a philosophy? Uh, Jesus, my friend. Jesus. Lots of people are into Jesus, and not a whole lot of people are into philosophy. I'm out of ammo, I'm getting closer. Alright, where are you at? I'm um, so, I became a... I was kind of... Um, something like a creaster. A creaster? Yep. I don't know what that means. Ah, double team. Um, you know, only going to church on Christmas and Easter. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay. Uh, and uh, even kind of like not some years, not even that, but um, ended uh, still always kind of like prayed and had some sort of awareness and relationship and uh, with God. But uh, really, then I became an agnostic for like a short minute went in my senior year of high school and uh, ended up uh, really thinking, all right, this is it. If I don't find if God doesn't find me, if I don't find God right now, like I'm just, I'm going to become an atheist. And I didn't know the word at the time, but I basically was going to be like full on nihilism. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but just thought if God, if no God, then no meaning or purpose or. Um, dang it. Oh man, I didn't realize he was all the way out there. Oof. Um, and so I ended up uh, reading Isaiah 53. And mother passages in the Old Testament just found myself really thinking that like this is the Messiah, this is Jesus, um, and had a ended up uh, pulling over the next day. Ended up 
ended up uh, the next day where I was late to school and I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna like try to uh, pull over and open my Bible and just see where God tells me about if Jesus really is God and just kind of did the unpardonable sin and just of just like, God, speak to me, wherever it is, I'll believe, right? <laughs> Um, but thankfully, it was a passage that really was kind of like displaying the deity of Christ. It was a passage where Christ was calming the seas. And they think, oh, who is he that even the uh, seas obey him? And uh, had felt the Holy Spirit in a really tangible way and felt joy and happiness. And this lasted for about a year. Um, and then I had a season of doubt. And where I was just like in this existential crisis, in part because I bought into like some sort of, oh, some sort of like hard evidentialism. And um, I thought like, no, in order to know something, you have to be certain about it. And, you know, it wasn't too sophisticated philosophically. And this like caused existential crisis. And um, long story short, I ended up reading Warranted Christian Belief. I realized I had better epistemology and that my former epistemology was whack as crack. And uh, then, yeah, that's, 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 you know, I thought, ah, I definitely want to do philosophy and, uh, you know, make a career arguing for this sort of thing. Not a career in Call of Duty, though, because I have killed two people and have died uh, already, like, way more than that. So. That's interesting, round. So you, uh, you pulled over the side of the road and you went full exactly at night. You were just like, where does Jesus say I am God worship? Man? Yeah, and basically. Like, oh, I'll show you where I said it. That's right. Bro, my, I mean, my, uh, you've been paying attention to it. Um, I love when people, especially if like, people want to say that the Mark's gospel has low Christ dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. My, the last half a year of research and videos I've been making have been, like, novel arguments mm. for high Christology and Mark's gospel connecting, um, chaos and That's neat. That's really neat. So I just want to point out the scoreboard here. I had eight kills. <laughs> <laughs> How many kills did I have, Dad? I had one. That's, that's one more than last time. I like at no point do I ever know what's going on in this game. I, I had I had double your kills, man. <laughs> oh man, that's uh. <laughs> That's 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 the difference between an amateur and a professional, right there. That's right. That's right. So Matt. So case. Yo. So Calvin. Hey, so I'm gonna tell my I'm gonna tell my son to put one more, and then I'm gonna tell him he's done and mess in. Is that, is that cool, Matt? Dude, like I said, it's whatever. I'm I'm chilling. Whatever. You, whatever you guys want to do. All right, just rejoin, real quick, and then play one more, and then he's gonna play. Okay. All right. Love you, buddy. How old is he? Nine. Dude, I Aww. my my oldest is turning four. I have three boys. I my oldest is for turning four on Tuesday. We're celebrating his birthday tomorrow. That's awesome. Um, and yesterday, so I took him to this like thing called Cubbies. If you, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if cats like what? No, it's like it's like this little like, it's like this little Christian school thing for little like for little kids pretty much. Um. And before we went yesterday, I, this is just like one of those proud dad moments. Um, before we went yesterday, it was just me and him. And I, so I took him to the grocery store and we just like sat down and ate some sushi together. Mm. And then this morning, um, we were all together like as a family. And he goes up to he goes up to my wife and he goes, oh, dad and I went on a date yesterday. I want to go on another one. And that was really fun. <laughs> this is so cute. And now that I'm like really excited for him to be older so we can... Um, Call of Duty together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we play Call of Duty. We play basketball. We watch Dragon Ball. Uh, you know. It's just... Yeah. Dude, I, my, 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 I just went. My son and I just watched the uh, Broly movie. Nice. Together. It was great. Tyler, why is Gohan the greatest character of all time? Because he is the go. Oh, and you don't. Do you? Are you caught up? Are you caught up, man? Oh yeah. Oh man. Caught up where? On what? On uh, the the manga in J uh, Japan, the one that just released. Oh no no no! I'm not on the manga. No, nah, dude, I don't do Dragon Ball manga. I need to. You can send me some spoilers though. I'm, I'm okay. down. 
I am trying to mess with some settings because my mic just keeps on doing weird stuff. Let me know in the chat if that's fixing you. Dude, I've you have wait, Tyler, are you reading the manga too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, Dude, Tyler, oh. an OG I'm, Dragon Ball. Like, I am like, so, oh, wow. dude, I'm so, I hate that the manga ended where it did. <laughs> because I'm just, like, so ready. Uh, so, so Matt, uh, Gohan oh, had, went Super Saiyan, or went Beast again. Yeah. And Goku and Vegeta weren't fighting, and so they were like, oh, wait a minute. What is that? Could it be? Daddy, you might want to meet all the and, and then um, uh, their Vegeta's like, no way. And then Vegeta's like, I hear he's... That Bulma says he might have surpassed us now. And then so then Goku comes back to, to Gohan, and he's like, hey, what's up, man? And yeah, that's, that's where he leaves off. Oh my gosh, I love it. I just want to point out, I think it's great that like in the middle of that, Tyler's son was like, dude, shut up, you're going to get us killed. <laughs> 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 yeah, I thought it made sense that Gohan surpass, um, you know, the two. The, like, be, they need to refocus all of Dragon Ball back on the Gohan, like originally intended. Yeah, exactly. Originally intended. I, dude, I Enemy Gohan is. The, the only thing I wish it like they would do when they're writing Gohan is like not make him constantly like hit a peak and then all of a sudden he just stops training yeah. again i just want to yeah. see gohan go go just beast mode pun intended <laughs> well he, he's now gone it twice I and know. uh there's a lot of people speculating he's gonna spar with goku that'd be sick Tyler, um, did you see that that art that i sent you that somebody animated um beast gohan yeah on tra like training with uh, vegeta yeah um okay have y'all some uh austachian 4850 asks have y'all read the jujitsu kaisen manga i have, I have. not I'm, I'm, not. I'm, I'm 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 not super ahead i'm i'm on like chapter 239 i am definitely way farther than the anime though it's awesome it's literally the goat um i've been uh my, my my manga of choice has been um, Black Clover. All squad members are in the safe I couldn't get into it, man. I tried. You have to... How, what, the anime or the manga? I think the anime kind of turned me off. It was too, like... I don't know. It's too, like, kiddish. I don't, I'm not into the kid anime <coughs> Bro, stuff. It's, not, it's not very kiddish if you, like, suffer past the first half of the... Uh, season like the first season it gets really good that's what i hear i got dang it i hate enemies that force you to endure cringe. i know that's how i felt about my hero academia uh yeah dude <laughs> dude we are jutsu kaisen season two is one of the greatest anime seasons of all time jujitsu kaisen stamp stamp on that okay if... have you guys watched mob psycho oh not... yeah dude Yes, dude. Come I'm, on, I'm, I, I haven't, I've, I just like never wanted to watch it because it looked so goofy. But I'm actually having a blast watching it right now. <laughs> it's, dude, it's so fun. I love that show. Look, it, this might seem like blasphemy to some, but I tried to get into One Piece because I really enjoyed the live action. I couldn't get into it. Nah, dude, I can't do it. Um, sorry, I felt, you, I felt the same way. W Tyler. I felt the same way. <laughs> I heard One Piece gets really good later on. It's just like Matt no, said. No, no. It's just no, no, no. The pacing it. is abysmal. So like Dragon Ball suffered from pacing for like for yeah. years, Locate but they learned from it. And you know, Dragon Ball Z got way yep. better towards the end. Like the Cell Saga, <coughs> Boo Saga, even for some reason, oh! One Piece continues to do cringe pacing. Like it takes them ten episodes just to like say. I'm gonna fight you, and then it takes another hundred episodes to, you know, do a, one fight. Well, the, no way I'm watching that show, dude. The animation, man, was like, <laughs> yeah, the that's first good. Season. oh, it's so bad. I'm sorry, I know there's like one piece. Of no, I didn't really like it that following. much. I couldn't. I love how. I love how this is like supposed to be like a theology philosophy Q and A, and the whole, everybody, everybody, including the chat, is just fully invested in this anime discussion. <laughs> 
like, yeah, nah, yeah, yeah. like Jujutsu Kaisen. So I read ahead, I read the manga on Bleach and Naruto, like back in the day, because I'm mm -hmm. old. And I'm I'm now reading Jujutsu Kaisen. Dude, Jujutsu Kaisen is the the goat. It's the uncrowned goat right now. I'm telling you, like that show is ridiculously intelligent. The storytelling is incredible. The fight scenes are like mind blowing. It's incredible. That's all I got to say. I'm not gonna do no spoilers. Oh, 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 behind you. Oh wait. Oh yeah. You're, 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 We're. Did we lose? Did we lose your son? Yeah. He, we we accidentally lost him in the lobby. Yeah, uh. Um, I left because I thought I was done. But then. <laughs> That's okay. Do you want us to pull out for him? That's okay. We we finish this. You got gas moving in. I didn't realize. Was that hot? You wanna come up here and say hi? Oh, are you? Okay. Somebody in the chat uh, chat asked Tyler, who is your favorite historical theologian and why is it Martin Luther? Ah, funny. More jokes, guys. <laughs> I don't. Un I I am I'm not endorsing the uh, savagery towards you right now. Just so you know, Tyler. <laughs> I, um, uh, what was the question? Just the historical theologian? I mean, it's gotta be St. Thomas and Pseudo Dionysius are my boys. What's your My favorite historical theologian? Yeah. Um, if we're talking, I mean, honestly, I consider Lewis a theologian and a philosopher. I know a lot of people, like C.S. Lewis, I'm sure a lot of people would probably fight me on that, but. He's the one I like the best. If we're gonna have to go like more ancient, more old school, um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that for a second. Yeah, if we're going with philosopher, obviously I gotta say my boy, you know, Alvin Plantinga. But it's just theology. But... Let me think. I can't I'm read. So. Jesus. Yeah, those of you in the chat start asking questions about God and stuff. <laughs> what about non-Christian philosophers? Who's your who's your goaded non-Christian Ooh. philosopher, Tyler? Gosh, bro. Yeah, I would say uh, I'd say I'm Draper, 100%. That's one of my favorites. Were you just chilling with him the other day? Yep, I was on a, I was on a call with him. I was, well, I was in a lecture with him. Okay. You're gonna make it, soldier. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Brought that guy of the kill. I'm gonna lock in. I enjoy Oppie if we're gonna go with atheist philosophers. I'll probably say Oppie the best. Honestly, like, like atheist philosophy, I think is is pretty riddled with responses to a sort of theism that I would reject. Um, so, like, I, I'm actually kind of skeptical even about like theists, like Swinburne doing uh, face theorem. I think like Bayes is like a nice heuristic, but uh, and it can be helpful and like strategically useful. But I actually like, uh, I don't think they got freaking explode. I'm sorry, it's spicy in here. God's not a hypothesis, you know, scientific theories, uh, for are for like how to understand the physical world. God's not even a thing, right? He's he's beyond all things. So, come, ah, I'm trying to, I'm, ah, oh, gosh, I'm pinned, I'm pinned down. Or save yourself, my friend. For all those people who just joined and heard uh, Tyler say that God is not a thing, he is in fact a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one of the that's one of the perks of uh, of his model is that he can say things like that. Yep, love you, buddy. Tyler being based as usual. Let's see, how did I? How did we do? Um, we didn't do very well, but it's okay. 
Did it already? Oh, it already. Oh, oh no, I don't get to see how many people I killed. Oh no. <laughs> I think uh, I got two. I think I got two that time. All right, who do we got in here now? Eli is Elijah playing with us? Yeah, he's gonna get in right now. Yeah, I'm already in. Okay, you're in. Yeah, I actually so, um, do. We'll see you in a second then. Really quick, oh, oh. I'm actually gonna change my primary weapon. Please. Yeah, you're good, buddy. <laughs> I was like, wait, chill, chill, chill. Dan, did you ask me a question earlier? You were like, Matt. Yeah, if I did ask you a question, I don't remember what it was, so it probably wasn't okay. important. I have a question for you, man, for Jesus. Oh, um, at what point in your life were you, uh, were you making memes? Mm. You were like, man, I should be doing this for Jesus. I should be yeah. baptizing this. I should be <laughs> drawing this up into the Godhead. Honestly, like, I always was making Christian memes. I mean, it's just, so this is part of you. It's an essential property of you. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I was trying to think of a a, what, a, a quip. What like? <laughs> what was the moment where you? Because you weren't always doing um, memes for Jesus. Like, what was the moment that you were like, you know what? I'm gonna start social media stuff. Because you don't even just do memes only. You also help. Yeah. Other people kind of like build their. Yeah, I'm like a semi full time social media uh, manager consultant. Um, so yeah, back in like, so I didn't make memes for Jesus. I just own it now. My buddy Michael Schaefer started memes for Jesus back in 2012. Like alpha things I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just own it. I didn't start it, but I finished it. Yeah, but like my buddy Michael Schaefer, he started it, and then. He brought me on at 2018 through like a bunch of weird like legal stuff we lost it and then i regained it um back in 2021 and so yeah there you go that's like the boring story yeah, of owning a, a massive meme page <laughs> that's interesting but yeah. that there was a big so like memes for jesus as a as a brand that was like highly sought after that was dude yeah it's ridiculous once like after you cross the threshold of like a hundred thousand followers it gets really weird out there with like businesses and legal stuff yeah. um and we have like a million um like total followers so it's like it's weird it gets really weird people are like oh, there's so much money there. <laughs> but there's really not to be honest there's not it's like you're making memes <laughs> Yeah, you know, so you're I, making at least like six figures. <laughs> well, whatever. You're in the uh, apologetics industrial complex, and you know it. You're just it. That's why we're all doing it. That's why we're all here. That's why we're screaming yeah. at ten I'm people right now. This is, this is where we get the money. Thing. I'm, I'm trying to create the apologetics industrial complex. <laughs> I've, I've got like, I've got like 800 and like 50 something subscribers on YouTube. I'm just saying that that that's uh, more impressive there. <laughs> Honestly, like genuinely though, it is my dream to have like all Christian apologists on YouTube and TikTok like, fully funded without a care in the world. That's like my dream. That's something that God has like placed in my heart. Yeah. So like a lot of my social media stuff that I that I do um, is just geared towards making it. that happen. And so We'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. Well, as a, uh, as a TikTok and YouTube apologist who makes, like, pretty much no money, uh, I really like the dream. I think it's really cool. Dude, yeah, dude. James, so, I got you, bro. So, uh, my son said to follow him. Okay. He's going to go, we're going to go into, like, the sewers and stuff. Oh, are we going to go to the secret room? Maybe. Maybe so. Yeah, I'll tell him to mark it out. Dan, I feel like you have like a loose cable or something. It, it is dropping off for some reason. Matt, you're getting pretty quiet too. It's dude, it's yeah. not it's not it's not a loose cable. It's literally just my mic for some reason it keeps on like setting the volume backwards. It's evolving. <laughs> this is uh this is big Google man trying to trying to silence the Christians. <laughs> just ran there's a there's an admin in here just casually lowering everybody's volume. 
Big Google. Big Google. That's not a that's not one you hear a lot of. Well, I mean, YouTube is owned by Google, Google right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's Instagram that's owned by Facebook, right? Um. Yeah. Instagram I feel like this like is meta. this is stuff that you should know, Matt. So I'm just going to direct yeah, that question. Meta, to you. meta is the umbrella that owns Facebook and Instagram. Okay. But uh, all right, what's everybody think about uh, Calvinism? Okay. What does everybody think about what? Calvinism. Oh, I just I just love it. Like I the most the most in, enjoyable conversations I have <laughs> with people on TikTok come from the reformed people who <laughs> fill my comment section with highly thoughtful, philosophically rigorous, and uh, biblically insightful comments. It's just thing, truly a blessing to Christianity. Matt is the coolest Calvinist I know. Yes. He's Matt, are you a Calvinist? Yeah, he is. And so I think I am. Oh, snap. I was, um, I was going to say I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Um, I, was, I, didn't realize, <laughs> I didn't realize you were a Calvinist. I'm sorry for being a little snide there. My bad. Nah, dude. That's hilarious. I, I think that the internet reformed community is the most toxic community that's out there. I think they're, they're horrible. Um, I think, too that I'm not like really a Calvinist. I'm like a Molinist Calvinist. Um, so I don't even know. Like I'm kind of like a weird guy. I will say that obviously Calvinists are like not represented by people on the internet. Like I've, yeah. you know, I've, read, I've read academics or not the, not the brain rot, which is the way people argue on TikTok. Yeah, dude. I don't, I don't think that that's representative of the entire position. That's just what I have to deal with the most. And oh yeah, no, the yeah, internet reform community is horrible, dude. I hate them. I can't stand them. I literally put out a video today that was, uh, were you because I made a comment about inheriting Adam's guilt, not original sin. Like it wasn't even about original sin. It was just about inheriting Adam's guilt. And next thing you know, I'm making a video about did we exist in Adam's balls in the Garden of Eden? That's, oh. just, that's pretty representative of how things go on TikTok. James, have you heard of um, Oliver Crisp and yeah. uh, Deviant Calvinism? What are your thoughts about him? Um, I haven't read much Crisp. The last Calvinist thing I read was John Frame, I think, his critique oh. of open theism. Um, I mean, I didn't find it persuasive. But... Yeah, I'm not a fan of Frame. Yeah. I think I read some of Crisp's other stuff, though, and, and liked it. And it was impressive. Yeah. I enjoyed Deviant Calvinism. It was good. Well done. Yeah. My buddies. Yeah, I think, um, who introduced me to Oliver? Uh, I think it was Chris, Chris Gogo, in, in the chat, Tyler. Yeah, uh, either Chris or I imagine James or uh, Dylan. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I like him a lot because he's, he's very balanced and moderated as opposed to a lot of internet Calvinists. Is he actually, so this is going to sound like a weird question, but is he like an actual like five point Calvinist? Because there are some people who are like, they take the label of Calvinist and then you yeah. talk to them and they're like, no, I affirm free will. And you're like, okay, yeah, we're, we're, what we're using that's different words. Am. So <laughs> yeah, so he, yeah, that's what I am. Like, Cause like I would affirm Molinism. Okay. So yeah, you can use reformed in like a very broad sense. Like, oh yeah, like the remonstrants were reformed. I'm reformed, right? That's how kind of it uses reformed. And then you have um, uh, individuals who want to say, okay, we got libertarian freedom, except when it comes to um, our salvation, uh, then we don't have uh, libertarian freedom. And then you have others who will uh, argue, wow, man, Ben is killing it. He's got like a helicopter. <laughs> hey, I'm just trying to come across <laughs> I'm over here um, trying to learn how to turn around and Pan's got a freaking AC-130. I'm just trying to find my son. My boy. Have you seen him? I'm looking for him. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, of course, and then there's like kind of fatalistic versions and then uh, obviously compatibilist versions and and all, all sorts of in-between. Where do you stand yeah, on compat compatibilism, Tyler? It depends on what one means by it. If okay. you can be a compatibilist and believe in libertarian freedom, I think um, that that's obviously counterintuitive. Um, 
But if, if you if you can do that, I'm, I'm open to the term. But uh, I'm definitely, uh, and by libertarian freedom, sorry, I just mean having the uh, ability to, to do otherwise. So path. Yeah. Uh, usually libertarian freedom is defined as ability to do otherwise plus indeterminism uh, is true. But if we just mean path, um, then, you know, I'm open to the term, but I, d I definitely do want to um, conserve, conserve path. So how do you feel about Frankfurt faces then? Yeah. Um, What's your response to a Frankfurt case? Yeah, so um, kind of, so I get you could do simple. I mean, you, you have the, um, gosh. All right, Mike, go ahead and you, you join, buddy. Make, make us look better. Thank you for playing with me, man. Tell your son that he's a G and we appreciate him playing with us. No, you're better than that, Daddy did. That's for sure. I got zero kills. I'm solid. I'll quit. No, thank you, buddy. Tyler, ask him if his back hurts from carrying us. <laughs> yeah, if his back hurts from carrying us. <laughs> hey, did I just log? Did I just leave y'all by accident? And I think you're in the lobby. You're with us. So uh, Tyler, you were gonna oh you were gonna yeah, so, about, uh, okay. how you this respond is, to Frank? This is like an extreme sport, doing philosophy while it's, playing video. It really is, is. yeah. It's really hard, but so the re so like full disclosure, one of the reasons I do this is um, a lot of people have said that these types of streams they like them a lot. Yeah. It really humanizes the people. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I'm all for it. I like it. I I play video games uh, frequently, but. Uh, um, yeah, no, so you have the flicker of freedom response, right? Which is to say, uh, well, there's like, you know, a millisecond, right? Where the individual has the ability at least to intend to do otherwise, even if they can't do do otherwise. And so uh, reference in reference to uh, intending to do otherwise, right? Um, there's, there's a split second where you have that. And so the responsibility, the locus of responsibility is found in the intention. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like those sorts of moves generally. Uh, you know, are middle knowledge versions of these, like Michael Bergman has suggested, are they possible? Um, if you don't think that this kind of counterfactual knowledge is possible, then they're, they're, they, you don't have to worry about these sorts of things. And you just have to worry about the mundane, uh, everyday uh, Frankfurt cases. Although, like I said earlier, uh, my, my view on God and foreknowledge is that God doesn't have foreknowledge. We have foreknowledge. God has knowledge too. God is His knowledge, and I, I don't think God's knowledge is propositional. And so it's it's it's, it's different than us. It's it's kind of like our knowledge, but it, it's not. Um, and so uh, I think that whatever it means for God to know the future isn't inconsistent with our ability to do otherwise. So do you think that not? So like there have been some who respond to Frankfurt cases. And with I mean, like, all right, well, maybe we should redefine or, or re-understand libertarian free will, not not incorporating this principle of alternative possibilities. Do you feel like those type of responses, which instead are like, okay, well, the decision, you know, it is sourced in you or not sourced in something external to you, stuff like that. Do you feel like those are things that like, yeah, that can work, and you're just like, well, that's not my preferred response, or do you think there's something like? Yeah, so you're, you're talking about just kind of like the the source and compatibilism, where the incompatibilism lies at. Um, the idea that you can be responsible and free um, just in case you are the ultimate source, you have ultimate responsibility, there's no other source external to you that's dictating what you're doing. And so you kind of redefine freedom to just specify re you're the source rather than the ability to do otherwise, which is a much stronger thesis. Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily like call it compatibilism because, like, I tend to, I tend to find sourcehood accounts of libertarian free will to be like not that problematic, but I am not a fan of compatibilism. So, like, I what so, like, source incompatibilism. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last word. Was it source incompatibilism? Oh, incompatibilism. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not something along those lines because, like, that seems intuitive to me. Like, I never got super into 
like researching Frankfurt cases because I kind of read about the controversy. I'm like, all right, I see the responses for the people who want to double down on PAP. And I see the responses of people who are like, all right, I'll just redefine it this way. And I'm like, yeah, one of those will work. And I just kind of went along my way. I don't know if you had like a, a strong feeling towards people. Yeah, who, well, I, who that I, is. I, I like the flicker of freedom response, but I also think that um, <laughs> intuitive. And I, I generally, my kind of mode, my, my, response my whole kind of mode of epistemology is if something's intuitive um especially if it has to do with kind of like the world rather than like god um then i, I want to make sure i preserve it until i can't preserve it any longer uh, i'm innocent until proven guilty um so yeah so i i, I have a little bit i mean I, I don't care like a whole lot but if you're like gonna ask me which which is my preference uh, going the source accounts versus app, I, I, I would go with that. Okay, gotcha. Real quick for you, Tyler, I got a question in the chat. Um, I'm a cat. Yeah, of course. I figured, so the, you... <laughs> figured the answer of that would be yes. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really awkward too, right? If I was just like, uh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely so. Uh, you can email me tmcnab at uh, francis.edu. Uh, let's see. It looks like we have another comment over here. Tyler, if if God was passable, do you think you'd be disappointed in your playing? Kind of hard. <laughs> yes, he, he, he probably would be. Okay. Okay. By the way, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I sent it. I sent him a, a, a pre-written version or a, a, a pre-published version, and so he he, he got oh, to okay. see it. So he's, not just like... <laughs> <laughs> so he's like staying up late drinking the Red Bull. He's like, ah. no, 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 that's not happening. Um, and then I actually wrote my response. So I don't know if you saw. I, I responded to that response. So we we had like these pre-written responses. Oh, nice. that okay. that we just dropped it all at the same time so it looked like we went crazy but actually it was like open I, I, like, I like the strat a lot <laughs> that's really cool okay so what i've since i haven't read all everything yet but like what are your what do you think is like joe's strongest point and why do you think it doesn't work yeah so Um, there we go. Um, <laughs> this is like the this is like the philosophical equivalent of pop ones. <laughs> yeah. You know that 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 show where it's like uh, the hot ones where he has uh, celebrities eat hot wings while he's like asking them questions and they're trying not to like have their mouth explode. This nice. is like that, but for philosophers. Like, you just get people wondering, like, all right, here's here's COD. Now, what do you think of uh, a principle or alternative possibility? Yeah, so I, I, um, uh, I think his strongest points are just oftentimes those who are defending the sort of classical proofs for God uh, don't oftentimes, um, I think, thoroughly look at alternative accounts um, that... Uh, wouldn't require, you know, like a concurred, un, uh, um, a uh, unmoved mover. So I just got destroyed by, looks like a, an infant or something. So that, was, that was great. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I think that that, that that could be right. That sometimes classical philosophers can be too quickly to reject existential inertia. Um, and uh, so I, that, that, that part I, I enjoy. Yeah, anyway. Uh, nice. Yeah. No, that's helpful. I'm also just like, I was also half paying attention as I was, because <laughs> I am outnumbered at the moment. Uh, Tyler, a question about epistemology of testimony. Oh, yeah. Here we go. yeah. Um, oh, do you actually do you actually do work in there? Um, some. Okay. 
so this is an area that I'm becoming increasingly interested in because of uh, arguments from religious experience. I think they're really slept on. And I'm curious, like, how you stand or just kind of what your general thoughts are on is kind of the arguments of, like, reductionism versus anti-reductionism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, uh, that? Like, what do you, or, or, like, a hybrid approach? Like, what do you, what do you want? No, so I'm hardcore anti-reductionist. Yes. I'm sorry. That's just, I mean, I figured so, that's what you were going to say, but, like, it, like, that's the position when I read about it. I was like, yeah, that seems obviously the case. That's where, so, what do you think is the best... Uh, what do you think is the best case for that? Like, I mean, is it so, just kind of the generic that, okay, listen, if you're a reductionist, you can't ever get this off the ground because you're just kind of in this infinite loop of trying to find. Yeah, well, I, so I, I think, uh, well, so first off, John Greco's book on, on testimony uh, is definitely a must have. Uh, and he argues for a, a, an anti-reductionist approach there. Um, but uh, I think, honestly, one of the things that attracts me most to an anti-reductionist view is just, I think it, it fits a lot more with how we come Gosh. to testimonial beliefs. I think it just, it, it fits a lot well with my experience. No, save your It just fits more with, like, our normal docs accident, like, practice. Yeah, that's right, that's right. It, yeah, that's my, uh, that's kind of my, why I've been getting, because, you know, I, I, I engage with uh, atheists and we talk about... Uh, you know, we talk about like arguments for the historicity of the, res the resurrection, and then like the go-to argument is something along the lines of, yeah, well, maybe everybody just lied, or like maybe everybody just hallucinated, and then like apologists are like, oh, well, here's reasons why they didn't. And I just want to be like, okay, like, I feel like we should, we don't normally put the burden on people who are using testimony to just like rule out these things. I feel like we should, I feel like the people who want to just postulate these things to avoid these have some burden here of, of undercutting this testimony. And so well, like, I'm kind of just drawn into that area. Uh, you know, like when I tell my kids something, they're like, oh, okay. Like they're, we're hardwired. Our cognitive faculties are hardwired to accept testimony as a, as a means to know. And I don't think there's any sort of justification that where there's some sort of like, oh, whoa. Take like a hard reductivist view where like all testimony really is reducible as uh, induction or something like that. Um, where uh yeah i don't i don't i don't think that that's like how we're hardwired that's how we're designed uh where we're really just doing some sort of inductive inference and that's really what testimony is um, so yeah anyway i, th I think but, but i think tyler extraordinary claims of fire extraordinary um claims. hey really quick I what's up oh nice that's really cool. Yeah, I was excited to hear you say that, Dan. I, uh... Yeah, I'm gonna So I guess like if I if I best way you can like hold perspective with, with regard to like talking to the average person and how they operate. I think I would say that it depends on the argument and depends on the situation. So like something like a like a Kalam cosmological argument or like a contingency argument or something like that, I think deductive can be I think deductive is the strongest. I don't think there's really a reason to necessarily go for a, like a you know a more abductive case but i think if it's an argument where you're trying to incorporate a lot of data like some more argument like, like a like an argument from computer or something if you have like a bunch of data that it just doesn't be very, very difficult to formulate all that into a deductive argument and it's, i think uh i think uh 
non-deductive argument could be better. Like an abduct. I like abductive cases more than I like uh, trying to put everything into like some Bayesian formula. Yeah, I gotcha. I'm really annoyed by that my mic is like acting out right now. Um, what do you think, Tyler? Well, if, if you couldn't tell from earlier. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I I would prefer um, uh, more kind of classical proofs, uh, contingency argument, and a fine tuning argument. Give me those two arguments any day, and I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll go with that. You know what? I don't know why I didn't think about this. Um, I have like a 100 page script on a contingency argument video. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I've had Rasmussen look at it. Schmidt, Joe Schmidt's looked at it a little bit. Um, having your feedback on it would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Send it my way. I'm going to do better, guys. I... I'm I'm going to just declare it, <laughs> right, 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 Matt. I'm just going to declare this. I'm going to speak it into the universe, and name it and claim it, and uh, I'm going to get three kills. I'm going to get three kills. There you go. Amen, brother. That's what, exactly what the Bible says. <laughs> exactly what it's exactly what the Bible says. What I'm going to the body right now. Okay. By the way, um, there's no there's no expectation to be here. I don't know if anybody starts getting tired, or if I start getting tired, we can start. Well, I'm pretty annoyed that the last two rounds, I don't even know if I got a kill, so I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh... That actually, that actually segues really into the next question that popped up in the chat, Tyler, which is, um, if God is unchanging, does that mean He won't be able to answer a prayer for you to play better? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know the nuances of immutability. Uh, so I'm yeah. Not that one. yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get three kills. You know. If we, I'm, I'm messing with you because I'm worse than you. I just want you to know that. Like, I, that's the only reason I'm chirping at you. Like, ah, see, my excuse, because uh, I'm just gonna give an excuse, you know, because um, that's what I'm gonna do, uh, is I normally play team deathmatch and not warzone, and so I'm a little would, bit better I at team deathmatch. I totally death. play team deathmatch with you. The only problem is that um, nobody else owns the game. I don't think. Yeah, I don't have it, but if you guys wanna, if you guys wanna go play that, you can. No, 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 no. Totally cool. Uh, I'll, uh, keep I literally going. spawn in, and then I like look to my left, and then I look to my right, and then I die. Like Tyler, that's Tyler, my experience. Other games besides Call of Duty. Uh, NBA, 2K, FIFA. That's pretty much it. Call of Duty. Every once in a while, I'll like go through like um, bus or something like that. Uh, Tyler, we're gonna we need to get you on the finals, which is me and fans do on new drug. My son's on that. <laughs> oh yeah? Has he has he gotten you into it yet? Not yet, not yet. Enemy soldier incoming. You should you should, that's that's my that's my new gaming drug. What, the finals? Yeah. I got I got my son upstairs, my seven year old. I got him on Pal World right now. I was actually gonna ask about that because I know that's the hot thing right now. Is he super into it? What is that? Oh you so, don't know about No, I never heard of it. It's like Pokemon but with guns, and you get oh, to yeah. shoot at the Pokemon and huh. the other trainers, I think. That sounds pretty cool. And like the the, the designs are like very clearly ripoffs, but it's it's awesome. Oh, I you know I think I saw a meme about that the other day. Like there is a uh, one of the characters. It looks like a Lucario from Pokemon. Oh, straight up, straight up. <laughs> An EB and like like some of them. That's really funny. The it's um, Lucario, but it's actually like an Egyptian god, I think. It was. Or what is it? Within a, uh, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question, fan. I was just gonna say with like Pal World, I know it became like the best selling game on Steam, like essentially overnight. And it's now one of the most like it's. It's number two for most people, concurrent players at one time. Like, there's it's, a, it's uh, just normal. There's an upcoming game that looks so cool. Uh, it's called, it was called eight, eight Days, I think. No, I think it's called Seven Days or Nine Days. Mm -hmm. It's pretty. You're pretty much just like a Saiyan, and you get to power up and like destroy planets. Like, it's a completely what? destructible environment. You can fly through space. Like, it's you. You need a. The only problem is it's, it's on PC. No. It's gonna be on console.
Tyler, what is the most uh, kind of cutting edge thing that's going in on going on in your field, or what is the direction that your field is going in that you're the most excited about at this point? Hmm. Hmm. So I do a lot of comparative philosophy, actually, and um, uh, I'm excited to see more and more comparative philosophy especially the sort of comparative philosophy that tries to synthesize views that look really at odds but actually maybe um, are consistent and so there's a new book um, uh, that I'm a big fan of that kind of does this with like Veda Vedanta Hinduism um, Shankar Hinduism and then um, uh, some other works that um, kind of do something similar, act in a similar way. Uh, one, one book, so like Fiona Ellis has a book uh, on naturalism that actually tries to do this with naturalism and theism. Um, so yeah, anyway, th that that kind of work really interests me. That's kind of the work that I try to participate in at least some of the time. <coughs> I think that has a lot of value right now because a lot of... We were, you and I were just talking about that the other night. Me and you about uh, comparative religion. The, no, yeah. synthesizing. I can't pronounce it right now. Synthesizing. Synthesization. Why well, can't I say the word? That's close enough. Yeah. Yeah, that that word of just like a lot of different um, things in general. How that's well, like I was thinking, like in the West, like people are getting drawn to like non the non-typical like western ideologies like a lot of people are just going to stuff like hinduism or buddhism just because it's like kind of seems exhausting i mean i'm like low-key kind of psychoanalyzing these people which is maybe potentially disrespectful but just just the vibe i get from talking with some of these people or seeing them post on social media it's all it's all properly basic from vibes man yeah yeah it's just like it's just people who grow up in the west they used to christianity and then they see like hinduism and they're like oh it's so spiritual and um, we're like paganism's making a big comeback right now. I'm not sure what that's about, but yeah. So I just see a lot of people going to like these like non non Western yeah. ideologies or non traditional ideologies. So people that are kind of looking at that in this uh, comparative sense, I think that has a lot of great value. How do you? Because okay, so this is actually a really interesting question. So that's like that sounds like a really good question. I think. Um, specifically, when I run into like religious nuns or some kind of pagan or um, a Hindu, whatever it might be, right? No, N O N E S. I was thinking N U N for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, whenever I run into people like that, um, you're losing ground. Move it. I, I, I usually bring up like divine council theology um, mm. and find a really nice segue into talking of like talking about Hindus in that, in that mm -hmm. regard. So, but I'm really curious, like in the world, of, in like the philosophical literature, Tyler, um, what, like, what's the route there, I guess, that you would take, or that you see being developed? For nuns? Yeah, like religious nuns, or if they're, right, or if they're like, the like some kind of, like, I, I was talking to somebody recently that's a Kemetic pagan, so like, he, he, he worships uh, Egyptian deities. Nice. Fringe. Um, so it's like from a philosophical standpoint what like what would be your yeah well okay so i'll say with nuns in general um i will do a, a like a, a lot of work trying to say listen i don't think that um that god is like a, a guy in the sky or person that's just like you and i but super great um uh, you know uh, god rather is the grounding of all things and, and and here here's a contingency argument don't you think that um uh that we need some sort of necessary foundation well that's what i mean by god and then usually like a lot of the times when i talk like uh, uh to nuns or even to like atheist philosophers they're much more open to this kind of conception of god um as like pure existence um pure actuality pure existence rather than kind of a little bit more of how you would describe god 
um, in a particularly uh, religious setting. Uh, with, with someone who was literally worshiping other deities, I probably would say, okay, well, um, 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 I would probably still just kind of go with, nope, never mind. Um, with getting some sort of necessary grounding, um, some sort of uh, necessary existence or, or, or existence itself type talk. And then that would lead me to the resurrection. And then with the resurrection, that would lead me to endorse um, kind of Second Temple Judaism view of, of God and gods, which would entail the rejection of um, the, the uh, kind of Egyptian polytheism or, or whatnot. Um, however, um, I wouldn't be uh, necessarily against saying like, oh yeah, there are other supernatural deities, <laughs> like a small D deity, yeah. and, uh, you know, kind of making sense like uh, of, of that, uh, but that just has nothing to do with existence itself, and what I'm arguing for is existence itself, and so, you know, I'll try to, try to get you convinced of, of this position here. Something like that. I was gonna ask you um, because Than mentioned that. What is your, uh, what is your take or your vibe or your feelings towards the uh, divine council stuff, divine plurality that's getting more attention in uh, Christianity these days? Yeah, to be honest, I, I know a little bit about it, but I I I I, I don't know enough to get that's sort fine. of intelligent yeah, yeah. sort of. No, I I. That's I We do have a question, a legit question in the chat. Uh, this is not a not a meat trolling question. We got a. Uh... I got it. Philosopher responds by saying that atheism is justified from its belief that arguments for God fail, and he gives an example similar to Russell's train of thought, whose belief in fear fails. Um, it said, "That's the question." So, so I, I guess the the idea is, is planning a right that um, uh, that just merely showing the arguments for God's existence don't work merely puts you in the agnostic position, not in the atheist position. Um, right, so I actually, if you want to say, like, atheism can be basic or something like that, just because it just seems like you, from all the suffering in the world, that God doesn't exist, and so God doesn't exist, or something like that. that, that that's one thing. I don't think, ultimately, it'll be warranted. Um, I think proper function requires theism, and if atheism is true, then atheism itself couldn't be warranted. And worries about this, but if you want to say it's like justified, apart from argument in this sort of basic way, from some sort of seeming from the problem of evil, that's 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 fine. But in generally, if you're thinking like, okay, I need an argument to, um, I need an argument to make to believe something, like a case for something. Um, well, then yeah, then 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 it's not going to be sufficient to establish atheism. You would have to take a step further and say like, oh, and and since all the arguments fail, probably then like, uh, God is silent, and if he was really there, he he'd give us better arguments or good arguments or I, some something like that, which, which would be developing an argument against God's existence. So I, I, I take Plenig's point to be correct. Gotcha. Um, okay, Andy gone wild. Oh, I always laugh. At that. I haven't heard of the argument from God's music by itself. Fire sales I over. Assume that it just Adjusting prices. It's really similar to like a standard argument for beauty. Um, mm. And I actually find like arguments from beauty to be pretty persuasive. Um, because it's not terribly surprising that like if a God exists, that we would live in a universe with beauty in it, whether that's like the audible kind or the visual kind. Keep your head up. 
I will say that if Indy is referring to an argument from Beauty there, but that does intrigue him. I have a 30 minute video on my channel in which I present an argument from Beauty, which they might find interesting. Well, you, you, I think like arguments, like if you're going to do the whole Bayesian thing, yeah. where um, would you expect beautiful music on naturalism? Uh, maybe you would expect it a little bit, but not as much as maybe on theism or something like that. I think that that, that could be one way to go with that. Yeah, and that's kind of the way it's all right. I was just kind of doing a brief overview of which is just typically my route that I go. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious, do you think like there could be a deductive route to something like that? Yeah, I, well, I mean, argument from beauty, uh, Phil Talon, in the two dozen or so arguments for God's existence, he takes a little bit more of a deductive style approach, I think. Um, and his is more about like, is there really beauty on naturalism? Like, not so much uh, you would would you expect it, but um, it's kind of more of a transcendental type argument from beauty. Um, so yeah, I think you can you can you can you can you know, different ways to try to cash that out there. Mm. Uh, I, that happens to me all the time, and I usually reach out to a scholar that I'm friends with um, to help me understand what I'm not understanding. Um, and they'll typically give me something to read um, about the topic I'm not under, like I'm not understanding. And then it just takes a little bit of extra work. And I usually text Than. <laughs> I pretend That's that nice. I can understand it, and then when I go out and I talk about it, I just memorize what to say. So. <laughs> It's, I sound smart, and hopefully other people are just like blinded by the big words. That's that honestly works nine times out of ten. So it's a decent strat. As the most layman person here, I'll I'll add to this by saying, um, what I do when I can't comprehend something is I'll look up the word that I'm not understanding. Um, if there's words, like because normally what happens is I can't understand what. Uh, like, pa uh, like a paragraph is saying because there's a word that's tripping me up or a term that's tying it all together. So I'll look up what that term means and then I'll see how that ties into the paragraph. And so sometimes in a paragraph, and especially if you're reading philosophy, you have to understand like 17 terms. And so just knowing which terms to understand because philosophy is like its own language. Would, would you guys say that's correct? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So le learning how to speak that language is you know understanding those terms because yeah. so like you know when tyler says properly basic he means a ton of things by that and yeah. you know you'd have to study a ton of um you know different epistemology um, even understanding what the word epistemology means you know you gotta you just have to look into definitions and a lot of philosophy i from what i understand is just get it, digging into definitions as as deep as you possibly can i mean what do you guys think yeah, no, I think that's that's, that's really good. Um, that's a, definitely the way to go. I know when I don't understand something, I quickly turn to IEP or SEP. Mm. Um, so just put an IEP, some philosophy term, or SEP, some philosophy term, and then read one of the uh, entries from, from them. And then if I still can't understand it, um, I'll email a philosopher who I know is kind of works in that little bit of the area and I'll, I'll send a quick message asking for clarification. <coughs> yeah. Um, what do you think the best argument for a necessary being being a sent? What do you think? What do you think is the best argument for a necessary being being a sentient being? Mm. Tyler, why, why don't you go from here? For, why don't you start for this one? If you got yeah. anything. Yeah, so I mean, honestly, like, I know a lot of philosophers don't go this route. Um, but I, I actually do think there, that there's something there with Craig's approach. Um, where, where are y'all landing, by the way? I'm just kind of... Yeah, no. Everybody's just jumping. No, I don't even think we're, like, playing as a team. We're just kind of, like, anywhere, everywhere. Spawn in and die. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing where um you know what once we'll if we're talking about pure existence we're talking about something um uh that you know is is non-physical and so 
um, not part of the space time realm. And so if it's not physical, then like, what are, what are we left with, with categories, minds, abstract objects, maybe something kind of like a mind. that's not a mind. Right. And, uh, it's clearly not an abstract object. So we got a mind or something like a mind. I think that, that's one way to do it. If, if you're like me and you think like, oh no, we, we, we're getting to like pure existence. We're getting to something that's not a composite. Um, then I, th I think there's kind of a more optimistic route to go as well. But generally, those are kind of the approaches I take. Nice. James, what about you? Um, I think, so I so like baked into, I don't really use like contingency arguments that much. Like I'm not really a fan of them. Um, I, yeah, I don't like Rasmussen's like style of argument. Um, <gasps> I know. If you, if you're on the, if, we're in, we're in some of the same Facebook groups, and I had like a little bit of a back and forth with them, and I just, yeah, I, just I don't find them super persuasive, but I don't get into that here. Um, I think some of his arguments are really good. I just don't think his arguments, like, <laughs> it reaches a point in his contingency arguments with the whole limits thing, where I'm just like, oh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm with the objectives on this one. Um, I So I usually do something like a, a Kalam or something like that if I want to do something similar. But I think that... I think the type of arguments that Craig gives for um, for why you know the, the first or the cause of the universe, <clears throat> and the first cause, I think those are good. But also, I've started incorporating I've started incorporating essentially teleological arguments into my columns. Or I think you can do the same thing with a, a necessity or a, a contingency argument. If you're like, okay, well, you know, we've got this necessary being. And then we look at reality, and it sure does look like it's a result of intelligence. I mean, it's, it kind of seems like the most parsimonious explanation here is that <coughs> the necessary being is an intelligent yeah. thing that brought about reality. So I've kind of been started incorporating, like tying in <clears throat> my kind of cosmological arguments into my teleological arguments. Um, yeah. I just realized one of the reasons I think we're just getting rocked right now is it's a Friday night. And yeah, everybody's all, playing. All the Twitch streamers are playing probably right now. Dude, we are we're not getting any of the Twitch streamers. We're getting Oh no no no. Yeah. If you pay attention to the kill to, to the kill feed, like you'll see Twitch TV on like the clan tags and stuff of people that are killing us. Yeah, and I was gonna say it also if it's like my son's high level that's like making us all go into the uh yeah, I was just gonna say that. Oh There's no! Well, it's kind of I love you. So if my if my KD is one point six and um, Elijah's was one point four, one one point three, yeah, we're getting in some <laughs> some fun lobbies. Um, so I have some arguments that I'll be putting up for why necessary being might be a mind. Um, I actually agree with you, Tyler. By the way, like a lot of people like to dog on Craig's approach to that and. Quite frankly, like, I'm not, I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's just people, I, sometimes I feel like people just like to dog on Craig. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I actually really do like Craig's approach. Philosophers, because he's conservative and gets a lot of attention. Yeah. And, and then, uh, and, and they want, they, they, they want the attention. And uh, apologists, because it's kind of the, the, the cool thing to do, I think, right now amongst apologetics people. So, I I have a problem with the amount of people who just bash Craig for it seems like the we, just the sake of bashing him. But I'm also saying that as someone who, as I grow in my theological education and background, yeah, I I bash Craig way. Like I just I feel like I'm just like more and more bashing Craig like left and right. And so it's like I can't be like your book manuscript, and I am not taking anything you're saying as bashing Craig. Well, have you gotten to the penal substitution section yet? Because I. That was a, okay. Wait until you get to that section. And also, you haven't read my dissertation, in which I have like I have like three different chapters where I bash Greg on like various issues. So well, so when I when I when I when I I take bash like I'm, when I hear bash from Craig, I'm like thinking about the people that are saying like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh no 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 not that no no. I just disagree with them. Yeah, I, when I, I'm using bash in a very loose sense. Like I just mean like critique. Like I'm not out here like Craig's an idiot. Like no, I think he's a phenomenal. Like, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I hate to I hate to, to make this move, but if you guys want to know some of my arguments for why the necessary being is a mind, um, you'll have to wait until that stage two video comes out. Nice, nice, <laughs> <pre> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Dang it. 
I will say there's also like a scholastic move that I was kind of alluding a little bit to earlier, right? Where it's like, um, you can't give what you don't have, and so, um, yeah. yeah. Let's go to the let's go to the boat. The cause of intelligence would need to, yeah, have that or something like it. Yeah, that's a that's a thing around. Um, let me see. Where are we going? Uh, the little boat thing. The shipwreck. Tyler, we have, uh, we've got another question for you. It's uh, what do you think? What do you is think the is best approach to understanding the incarnation, and why is it canonic Christology? Uh, yes, no, I, I don't think that's the best route. Uh, real quick, my son Elijah, he wants to know what this is streaming on. Uh, YouTube. YouTube. Uh, yeah, is this on your Exploring Reality channel? Okay. Yeah, it is. I don't know if you, I, I am having trouble hearing Than, so I may, I may repeat some of the things he says. Yeah, I don't, that's the... I have no clue how to fix this issue. My mic keeps on doing this thing, like it's resetting the volume all the way to its lowest setting, and I have no clue why. It's never yeah, done it, this before. So, I'll tell you what to do. Do you have you... Uh, echo cancel on? No. Do you have um, any like added other settings through, your, through StreamYard? that have to do with correlation with the mic? Let me check. I was going to say, Than, I, like, it might be that it's like an auto-adjust feature that you can just turn yeah. off. I was having that issue with my webcam. Yeah, I, it, the thing is, there is no button for that. And I pulled up the like app for the mic, too. And I'm, doing it, I'm trying to look and see if there's a... It might be StreamYard. StreamYard has never done this before. That's the thing. So this is a new issue. I don't know uh, what the issue is. Yeah, it's weird. I've never seen anything like this. So uh, Tyler, you were explaining why you're uh, reconsidering yeah, please your keep going. objection of chromatic pathology. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so I was just like, this is the longest I've gone without dying in a long time. <laughs> And it's completely fine if somebody asks you a question and be like, one second, guys, I'm in the zone. Like, that is completely <laughs> acceptable. Oh, no, there, there's, there's, um, there's no one in sight, so. Um, I got people on my site. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I take a Mysterian view on this. So I, I really follow James Anderson and his work. Uh, he's got a really great book on paradox and Christian theology mm -hmm. where he talks about how there appears to be contradictions within Christology or within the Trinity, but actually really what's going on is because our language about God is analogical and not unique. Mm -hmm. There's what he calls uh, unarticulated equivocations. And so we need to realize that, um, that there's unarticulated equivocation <laughs> from the creeds and just say it's beyond our kin to kind of figure out exactly how this is all consistent. And I think this especially gets boosted and made plausible if you affirm the sort of conception of God that I do, um, where God is not a thing uh, and he's more dissimilar than similar to us, and that sort of thing. I think I think the the analogical language bit can can actually cover a lot of uh, these sorts of words. So I'm gonna play devil's advocate for just a second and uh, say, what would you say to someone who's like, that just sure seems like a hand wavy cop out in the face of something that would be a contradiction in your views and uh, gosh, that's such an annoying. <laughs> not saying that you're actually making that. I'm, I just, I'm not. Yeah, I'm just like I'm just saying like. I've heard people say stuff like that so often, and I'm just like. Ugh. Yeah, this is not. This is not. I, I, I think, this is not a representation oh. of garb right now. I'm saying if somebody was like, hey, listen, one of the ways that we assess positions is their internal consistency and whether or not they entail contradictions and. It seems like you're just kind of going to hand wave away any oh, potential God. contradiction by saying, ah, oh, mystery, and ah, oh, we can't understand. What would well, you so maybe you think, like, with quantum mechanics and with Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, right, that um, there's no way to really resolve certain tensions, or at least none that we have come up with uh, currently, how to make sense of all this because it's inconsistent. Um, uh, but uh, nonetheless, we have independent warrant for each, so let's just kind of keep going with both. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a similar move that I'm suggesting, but I'm actually saying that my conception of God is actually predicting mystery. That if my conception of God was correct, then actually you would be expecting 
uh, a, a lot of this to, to be the case. Uh, it, it, if you're thinking that, that God is more dissimilar than similar, if you're thinking that God is not a being, he's rather existence itself, like, if you're thinking all this, then, then yeah, I mean, you're going to expect, like, the probability of having unarticulate equivocations are like one. So then, couldn't someone say, listen, if, if your worldview is one, which entails contradictions, that seems to be a problem with your worldview. Uh, oh, like, what, couldn't just come and take what you just said and be like, yeah, that's the fact that this is expected under your worldview is exactly a reason mm. to reject your worldview, because usually we usually we try to avoid positions which entail contradictions or make, you know, these problems expected. Like, that's the exact opposite of what we try to do in science. Yeah, so, um, no, I, I just, I, probably, this is the last question I want to put to you, by the way. So whatever you say, no, this, I'm, yeah, I'm just, yes, I'm just yeah, poking at you for the, for the chat here. Theories where we think we have really good independent evidence for, um, a particular theory, nonetheless, it, it conflicts. We, we generally don't just abandon ship and say, well, yeah. I guess let's go ahead and throw away our, our, our theories. Um, we don't generally do that. And, uh, I would have, again, independent reason for saying that my worldview is correct like all things uh have an explanation um uh, at least all contingent things have an explanation and um if you think that all things have an explanation then what um grounds all things can't be a thing it can't be a member of the set unless it's going to explain itself and so uh now we're talking about that which is not a thing that which is not a thing um is a uh, very um uh, mysterious uh, if you would say it's beyond being and so we don't know a whole lot about it so yeah i mean it's just gonna ex expect um unarticulated equivocations to go but don't worry um we have independent reason for thinking that uh we should expect this given that we need a grounding of all things that that which is not a thing so that's how it do that and, and again that's not what we do in science whenever we have yeah. conflicting theories i made a really strong i made a really long video about that <laughs> yeah that's i was actually going to bring that up those things i just put on the screen yeah so somebody asks um what do you think is the best rebuttal to fine tuning i found fine tuning pretty strong and i'm interested to in rebuttals to it well, real quick son uh, before we answer that do you want to talk real quick about your video i'd, I'd be interested to hear oh um yeah, so the t it's titled, like, Do Christians Make Excuses for Their Faith or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, and I basically just go into philosophy of science stuff, um, talking about, like, falsificationism, the Duhem Quine thesis, and confirmational holism. Uh -huh. um, and just kind of out, and I, and I even outlined some examples in, like, the, in the, the scientific literature where we have things that seem to falsify, like, a particular theory. We have strong evidence for, but we didn't engage in, like, bad science when we just decided to say something like well this thing this might falsify this might seem to at least falsify what's going on but we have really strong evidence for this theory and then later on finding out if some auxiliary was the issue that was causing the the uh -huh. falsification not the hypothesis itself like the standards uh the standard solar model was an ex the, was the go-to example i went to with that um with the solar neutrino problem if you're familiar nice with that stuff yeah, no, I think I think it's a it's a, a, a great move to. Yeah. <clears throat> so James, what do you think about the fine tuning argument? Um, I think it's great. I don't think I've ever really seen much. Uh, I don't think I've ever really seen any strong arguments against it. But obviously, I'm biased. What and do you think of What do you think of like the electrons and love argument? It's been a while since I've looked at that. You'll have to refresh me. Um, I haven't looked at the tuning stuff, and I haven't kept up with the literature in a while. Yeah, yeah. The, the basic idea is just like, um, the, depending on how you, how you cash out your fine tuning argument, right? Like the theist might, in a Bayesian case, say something like, "Look, well, we have this fine tuning data, and you sure maybe theism could explain um, why we have these fine tuned constants that like allow for the um, existence of embodied moral agents." And, and sure, you could like come up some some reasons for why God might create embodied creatures, but why couldn't God just create unembodied creatures that can love each other and make moral decisions and all this other stuff? 
Well, um, it seems like a really crappy argument. So, <laughs> so the so the question is, okay, yeah, you can explain this data by positing x. <coughs> if we're with the agent that you're positing that did x, he could have he could have done something different that kind of got similar goals. Crap. Yeah. Sorry. That seems like horrible. Like, so if I'm walking in the if I'm walking in the woods and I see like my name spelled out like hello guard, welcome to the welcome to the jungle or something like that. And I come to posit that that was the result of an agent. It seems really weird to object to that and be like, oh, well, if there was an agent, you know, he, he could have spelled something different. He could have, you know, he could have put a different message there. So therefore, you're not justified in, in inferring agency here. Like, that just seems very odd. Like, I can be like, yeah, God could have made non embodied agents, but that doesn't change the fact that he's still the best explanation for accounting for what we have. Hold on. I'm. I'm zoning in right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so like, that's that's, a, that's like, one of those like those arguments with fine tuning where I'm just like, so like one of the things I like that Lucas Barn does when talking about fine tuning sometimes is he just takes the argument. He's like, all right, let's just let's just apply this to something like, like his he gives the example of like letters in the sky spelling out like. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, can we all agree that that would be evidence? And then he just says, okay, let's apply that same objection to that and see how stupid it is. And you know what I mean? Like, and I think that that's a really good way to go about some of these objections to fine tuning arguments because once you kind of put them in that light, you just see how ridiculous they are. What do you think, Tyler? Um, do, you, do you like the fine tuning argument? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I okay. like it. Uh, I think that. Um, I think that uh, generally the kind of objections against the fine tuning argument, especially kind of like most popularly discussed, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, someone wants to come heal me, by the way, it's totally okay. Never mind, someone's here. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, like multiverse objections and so forth. Yeah. Um, I don't think they're very good because uh, it makes the theory, the, the intrinsic probability, I think, higher. Um, sorry, lower. And um, uh, I think that um, that generally it just moves back the problem on a lot of these models where you have like this some sort of mechanism or conditions that are in play that are um, that are responsible for producing these universes. And so, like, well, is that does that need to be fine tuned? And so, yeah, like that. Oh gosh, James, I need help upstairs. I'm coming down. Where is he? Where is he? I don't know. He's coming oh, in. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, hey, we got pinched. Oh. Very place though, guys. Hey, I did like zero. Better. We did great that. that. We did great that time. <coughs> one more, and then I think I'm gonna call it a night. You said one more. Yeah. Cool, cool. But Matt better get here. Oh, he's. I didn't even realize he was gone. My wife's in the chat. <laughs> She goes, is this Fortnite? <laughs> uh, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, keep going. No, that was it. That was okay. Serious. Yeah, I mean, what was I was gonna say something and I forgot what I was gonna say. I think I'll say I'll say this. Um, I think if you're gonna put up a fine tuning argument, I think you better be ready to give an account for. The, like the the problem of this teleology and your fine with your fine tuning argument if you're gonna give like a Bayesian case um so if like if you guys have if you read like Trent Doherty's work um on problem on the problem of animal suffering I think what he tries to do is like outline why theism would actually entail the theodicy and why the theodicy then would entail some kind of like um, fine tuned parameters that actually allow for suffering and stuff like that to exist mm. um and I think that you should be able to make that kind of a move. Not that I think, at the end of the day, I don't actually think it makes or breaks like the case for theism if you're going to do look at this from a Bayesian case. Because I think I'm more than willing to take a probabilistic hit by tacking on a theodicy as, um, as an auxiliary and taking that ad hoc hit. But I just don't think we need to. Um, so, yeah, I think... From a psychological perspective, I think you should be ready for that. I also, I'll say that, I think <laughs> that like any objection to the teleological argument was like the electron of love or I don't know, something like that or just necessity. 
like I'm going to incorporate into my argument that whatever argument you give for that is going to be a different explanation than probably what you're going to give for an explanation of religious experience and miracles and beauty in the world. And so at the end of the day, I can be like, listen, you're positing a bunch of different kind of ad hoc and plausible explanations to explain all these different things. Whereas I have the one consistent parsimonious expl explanation, which explains all of the data. So even if you think that you have this, you know, even if the theistic explanation and the, um, the naturalistic explanation are both equal, just in considering fine tuning in a vacuum, even if I granted that, which I don't, but let's say I just granted that, I'd be like, okay, great. But my explanation also explains all of this other data, which you are then going to have to create other contrived explanations for. Mm -hmm. And so my my explanation is better because it explains more of the data in a simpler way. Yeah. So I could just grant them an objection to fine tuning, and I can be like, cumulative case, you know, take it all as a, you know, do something Bayesian there, and be like, or or just employ principles of theory evaluation of. You know, which, which theory explains the most data, yeah. and I think theism is going to come out laughing. Yeah, that actually leads really nicely into the next question, um, because you talked about, like, simplicity. <coughs> so thoughts Sorry. on divine simplicity. Um, I don't really have any... I don't really have my mind made up on divine simplicity. Um, and Tyler, you might be able to help me out here, because... Like the one thing that I feel pretty sure of is like absolute divine simplicity. Not that like I'm just not a fan of it because um, it seems it's it it seems to imp in, entail like a modal collapse. Um, so yeah, I mean like that's kind of where I'm at. But I know you would disagree, Tyler. So I'm really excited to hear your thoughts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, you know, I think we're, we're you know my Thomistic metaphysics here, right? Where um, where I don't think God can be a composite. Uh, there'd be composites need explanations. <coughs> um, something more fundamental uh, to two composites. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so I would take I would take a, a hard account. I also here's a, here's a more unique way of, of looking at this though. Um, if we're talking, so I, I've, I've been thinking through an argument for classical theism. Um, Tentatively calling it the argument from convergence, mm -hmm. and where, like, kind of where we talked about earlier, where um, you know maybe if Taoism, maybe if uh, certain versions of Hinduism, uh, you know, definitely Shankara's view, I think, does teach uh, a hard simplicity account of God, um, and maybe you actually need in order for Buddhism. The theses of interdependence and impermanence and emptiness to be consistent with theism, you need to affirm a hard divine simplicity. And so maybe it's like all these religious traditions, like they're converging together and, you know, they're assuming it. And so maybe that's evidence for. Um, oh, that's actually really interesting. And, and so that, that, that would be if you're like really into comparative philosophy and want convergence, then it seems like divine simplicity definitely is like the only way to go. So. Um, that's kind of a different way of, of approaching it from the typical analytics field mm -hmm. or the Thomistic one that I just figured. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Um, I know it's. I know we're gonna end it here pretty s after this match, so I'm just gonna move to the next one. Um, Can I make a comment to India real quick before we move on? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say because he was the one who asked that. I'd like take the exact opposite position that Tyler does. Like I. I'm a, I'm, I consider myself a partialist, and I was just going to say, I have a video on uh, Big John Steele's channel and on my channel where I uh, kind of give a defense of, of partialism and kind of a trinity of monotheism. So I take like a horrid, about as far as the opposite as you could take on the divine simplicity stance, but I won't get into that here. I'll just say if you're interested in that type of position, I talk about some, some of that with uh, that interview I did with Big John. Ch Tyler, did you, are you? Sh <laughs> I, I heard gunshots and I was like ready to go. And I think Tyler's just <laughs> trolling you guys. <laughs> That's funny. Earlier in this stream, where I was like um, uh, hitting you with my gun, then, but uh, you, you weren't noticing. I, I was probably just in the zone. <laughs> I said I was a partialist, and Tyler, Tyler was just like, I gotta shoot something or I'm gonna. <laughs> Literally. Extra, extra self revive here if anybody wants it. Okay. Um. Andy Gone Wilds asks, 
thoughts on Pine Creek. I saw his debate with IP and didn't find his arguments convincing. Um, I th I like I I I like Pine Creek as a person. I he th I think he's a really nice guy, and he's never been disrespectful to me. Um, he's never been like a jerk to me. Um, he said nice things to me. So, I know a lot of other people have issues with him, but um, yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Revive me. Oh. I don't want it. Oh, wait, wait, okay, I got it. I got it. Something. I got you covered. I got you covered. No. I did not want to die right there. You're good. I got gotcha. you. In case you guys couldn't already tell, I have no idea what I'm doing. Matt, you are the eye candy. Don't worry. Uh, Indie Gone Wild, it's it's part, like part, partialism, like P A R T. And I would just say, uh, go watch, go watch the stream I did with John before you before you write it off. All right, um... Tyler, I mean, you're friends with Chad, and he affirms a, a partialism. Yeah, 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 Does that, does that, uh, do you guys fight about that? Chad, um... Oh, shoot. We're getting pinched. We gotta get out of here. Chad McIntosh. Uh, yeah, 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 he's a friend of mine. We co-author stuff, like, on Aliens. Uh, but, yeah, we disagree here. <laughs> Oh shoot! Oh, still alive. Yeah, like I said, we're getting a uh, multiple teams. Somebody said I have another question. Whenever I try to research a topic, it usually takes a while to find a gym or a solid resource. Do you have any <laughs> resources that you go to often for research? Yeah, IEP and SCP. I mentioned those earlier. Uh, yep. Really, really good. Uh, and also, just go to Phil Papers. It's like Facebook, but for philosophers. Yep. And uh, just type in like a topic, and you can find papers oftentimes for free um, through, through the. So I, I, I'd recommend those three sources. I'm also like, you guys can always email me too. So if you ever have like a question on like what to read on a particular topic. Right, so must survive the countdown, it says. So survive. What happened? Um, oh, are you doing a data heist thing? No. Well, I, I guess maybe by accident. It's all not so good. So in addition to what they said, so like with philosophy, like Stanford Encyclopedia, stuff like that, like that's really good. When it comes to something like biblical studies or theology, kind of what I've gotten in the habit of doing is I just have certain biblical scholars that I know I find their work to be pretty well-rounded and comprehensive. <clears throat> so like if I'm, and so I, I kind of start with looking at their stuff. So uh, if I'm looking at something regarding a New Testament te text, a lot of times I will start with just seeing like, okay, does Craig Keener have anything on this? Because Craig mm -hmm. Keener does a really good job at representing the literature. If I'm looking at something in the Old Testament, I'm like, okay, does Mike Heiser have anything on this? If he does, what does he cite? Stuff like yeah. that. And then if after I've kind of after I've gone through the the, the biblical scholars or the theologians who I know that do good work, and I, I see, okay, have any of them, you know. Have any of them talked about this? And do they have bibliographies that I can mine and kind of go down the rabbit hole? Um, with something like biblical studies, it's kind of just yeah, a matter of, of like having a couple of good commentaries to go to. Like, and for me, like I'm, I'm thinking like more academic commentaries. Um, so something like Anchor Yale, um, Hermenia Bible commentary tends to get really into oh, I just got beamed literary and uh, text critical issues and stuff like that. So I've been. I've utilized them in my research quite a bit lately. And so just kind of learning to find like, oh, and then that's maybe the other thing is like finding, learning to mine bibliography. So maybe if you find a, re uh, like maybe you're, you're researching something on. Uh, yeah, we need to get out of here, you guys. If you can find a work like, if you can find a work that has a bunch of different authors talking about something, so let me give an example, something like you're, you're trying to find out a question about the atonement. And you know that there's a, a TNT Clark handbook on the atonement. What you might do is you might go to that book and you might just peruse the chapters, see if there's any chapters that seem familiar to what you're looking at, and then go look at that bibliography, look at the paper names, look at stuff like that. Um, kind of my, my, my just my way I research is I just try to find I just try to find a thread. Like that's all you're trying to find when you're just getting started is try to find a thread that you can keep pulling and just keep kind of going down the rabbit hole for. That's that's just how I kind of. Yeah, de 
<laughs> I would say a really easy way of doing what James just said is like have some scholars you really trust on particular topics, read what they have to say on those topics, and then read the read the sources they cite on those topics. Because I mean, like I said, I said Craig Keener there. There are things that I think Craig Keener. I, there are things I disagree with Craig Keener on, and, and when it comes to like some of his interpretations of the New Testament stuff, but he's yeah. still like one of my go-to scholars. Because yeah. He's just so comprehensive. See, the, I don't like the, the, he's a continuationist. <laughs> What'd you say, Matt? That is a continuationist. Oh. So, uh, that's obviously like really good strategies and so forth, but really what's based is. Ah, that's not based. Um, is, uh, you know, looking up what the Catholic Catechism has to say about things or. <laughs> Even what scholars will use, have a scholar will use called Dinzinger. Looking that's at a good idea. Has to say. So I'm just saying. Definitely make sure to check out what John Calvin and Martin Luther had to say on it too. I have and to just, the, the Catholic guys. Hey Amen. I want one more five. It also helps just with the research if you have people you can ask because they don't learn yeah. stuff that you don't. Um, like I. Like I was researching some stuff recently on like priesthood and uh, you know like Old Testament sacrifices, and one of my faculty advisors has a lot of background in that area, and so it's really easy for me just to go to him and be like, "Hey, man, this is what I'm, this is what I'm reading about. These are some of the questions I'm trying to get answered. Like, what are some resources you've come across?" I have a question. In your bibliography. Yeah, so, I have a question about um, New Testament sacrifices. So I've heard that in the New Earth there's going to be sacrifices in the temple animal sacrifices in the temple uh what are your guys thoughts about that there's absolutely no evidence for yeah that. i was just gonna say like what what's the what's the reason why we would think that um <coughs> i'm trying to think i think there's from what i've heard there's passages in ezekiel i think yes yeah, that it's would indicate that where uh, so even in, in malachi they talk about having um sacrifices uh, in the eschaton, mm. uh, but uh, of course, <laughs> if you're Catholic, as if you follow the Church Fathers, you can uh, totally uh, make sense of of how this happens. But uh, saying, <laughs> Tyler is like the the goat of the Catholic apologist. <laughs> Been to I just want to make clear also, by the way, I actually strongly dislike Martin Luther and John Calvin. I'm just saying that to troll Tyler. Yeah, no, I don't know. Like, I, 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 in no area in my everyday life do I ever tell people to go read those people. I, like, if someone told me, oh, should I read this? I'd be like, no, I'm just doing it because I know he's Catholic. <laughs> my, where's my team? Well, I, I am go, getting I'm pegged. Scared. I'm dead. I'm just like yeah, standing in a small circle and I'm like, oh, I'm in danger. Come I back. Fan. Fan has five kills. I had two. I got you guys back, don't worry. No idea. I feel I feel the dub. I feel the dub. Let's just let everybody else fight. Yeah, we just <laughs> gotta play we gotta play really safely now since we don't have This is a really small circle. We got one right not dead. How many people are left? Oh, I got one down. Thank you. Yeah. More people up here. Man, I got lit up. I do not have much ammo. Oh, I'm so. I'm reloading, yeah, Tyler. Recently heard, a, recently heard an atheist saying. Oh, Hold on, Matt. No. Oh, crap. I'm done. <sighs> Let us cook. <laughs> Let him. Cook. Someone Do you see them? Gary Habermas's new book. I haven't read it. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Let me focus. Yeah, let them clutch this. Let me let me see if I can uh, answer these questions with my vast philosophical knowledge. Protestantism. I don't know what that is. Thoughts on the idea that Jesus never claimed to be God. Put forward by Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is wrong. That's base. Um, That's base, man. Yeah. Christian, I, I mean, Christ claimed to be God in multiple occasions. You know, Ego I Me, uh, Thans Cloud Walker, 
um, you know, you can see the, the Cloud Rocker. Um, uh, crap, what's the term? Yep, can't think about it. But yeah, Christ basically claimed to be Yahweh. Yeah, I'm dead. Being the Cloud Walker. He, he, you know, rode on the clouds. So they have Bart Herman's no, he on that. It. It's the Son of Man passage. Yep. Clouds. Yeah. Bar Bar I would Herman's. say to uh, second place is good. I would say to whoever had the question about Bart Herman, there second are several place. books that are dedicated just that to was, defeating Herman. That was our best. That was yeah. our best. I was trying to clutch it there, but it was a two v one, and all I had was an LMG and an RPG. <laughs> well, I'm happy with my two assists and my two kills. Heck how yeah. Good. How do I see that? What'd you say? How do I see how good I did before the game ends? No. Oh, you had you had two kills. Did I really? Yeah. I yeah, felt I like I did a lot more that time. Are you sure it wasn't like two and a half? <laughs> you did great. Don't worry about it. Thanks, Dad. Um, Tyler, you are free to go if you want to get going. I was just going to answer a few more questions here. All right, guys. Well, live long and prosper, my friends. Thanks for joining, man. Appreciate Thanks you. Thanks for hanging. Thanks God, for answering all the too. questions and letting me uh, get out of here. Totally. All right. I so yeah, so <laughs> did you answer that uh Harry, Gary Habermas book? Question. I, did. I, okay, I okay. said I haven't read it and I don't think Dan's read it. I haven't read it. Pages and it came out a few days ago. So <laughs> I haven't read it. I one I haven't read it and two it's not really high on my priority list because um I know people that have read it and had early copies of it and have told me it's just kind of like and it's no secret my opinion on the minimal facts argument. So um I've just, I was just told it's kind of like a long drawn out minimal facts argument still. So I'm probably just not going to spend the money on it to be just, if I'm being honest right now, it's not a high priority. Um, Dan, can you cash out the um, cloud blocker motif real quick? The cloud rider motif? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hold on. <coughs> Let me, here's the basic idea. I'm, um, a while ago, we we discovered um, Canaanite literature in Ugarit. We translated those texts, and we saw that there's like some interesting similarities between how the Canaanites talked about Baal and how they talked about Yahweh in the Old Testament. Um, and here, so the long story short is one of the kingship motifs uh, that the Canaanites had for Baal was that they called him like this, the cloud rider, or the one that rides on the clouds. Um, and what's really interesting is in the Old Testament, you can kind of see the Israelites, now that we have like access to some of the other ancient and recent works and translations of them, you can actually see that the Israelites kind of, they don't, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say that they borrow from these, um, let's put it this way, because a lot of, you'll hear a lot of, um, non-christians say something like well the bible stole from these texts and yada 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 and i don't think that's actually what's going on typically i think what's happening is more so that the israelites are just using the language of their like of their competitors religious competitors and attributing those things to yahweh as a form of polemic and so you see in the old testament they're attributing that cloud rider motif to yahweh in the old testament um there's one difference there's one key difference with this cloud rider motif and that's in i think it's in daniel 7 james am i wrong yeah daniel 7 is, is it 7 yeah. <laughs> um and so there's like a messianic vision that happens and it talks about um the coming of the son of man clouding riding in the clouds of heaven in daniel 7 and this is a little bit different because um the son of man literally just means the human one in in this context i think and so this messianic reference is like well okay, so we're going to have this Messiah who's a human one, who's also the cloud rider. Um, and that's really interesting. And then now fast forward into the Synoptic Gospels. Um, I don't know if it's in, I don't know if it's in John. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's in at least two of the Synoptics. Is it all three? I'm not sure. James, do you know? Are you, uh, are you talking about where Jesus uh, Yeah, but before Caiaphas. I know it's in Mark. It's in Mark and Matthew. Yeah, I don't remember if it's in Luke or John. Okay. Um, here, the long story short is um, Jesus is before Caiaphas and Mark and Matthew. And long story short, Caiaphas asked Jesus a question. Um, uh, Caiaphas actually asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? And then Jesus says, 
um, I am, and you will see the Son of Man riding on the clouds of glory, um, quoting Daniel 7. And then right after that, Caiaphas rips his, tears his robe and says, what more do you need? Um, then accuses Jesus of blasphemy. And so the question is like, okay, well, what's the blasphemy in question here? Is it the fact that Jesus called himself the human one? Um, or is it the fact that he's taking on this cloud rider motif that the Israelites would have only attributed to God? Um, and I would argue that Caiaphas is thinking it's blasphemy that Jesus is calling himself God. That's that's the that's the thing in a nutshell. <laughs> I, I do have to head out. Um, yeah. I know that, so MD Gone Wild says, thoughts on the Shroud of Term. I know that Mike Jones says that there's more evidence towards the Shroud of Term than he thought. And so he's actually inclined to believe some of the Shroud of Term. What do you guys think about that? I haven't I looked into the Shroud enough. All in on the Shroud of Term. Oh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's authentic and I think it. I think it constitutes very strong evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I don't think there are good naturalistic explanations for it. Um, a good book, it's maybe a little bit outdated now, um, but it's called, uh, it's kind of a good summary. Like I said, it's not the most recent work, but Resurrection of the Shroud of Turin by Mark um, Antonacci or something like that. Um, that's a pretty good one that kind of goes over a lot of the data. Um, there are some more recent books. I can't remember their name though. And then, um, there are a couple of YouTube channels. Who's the guy in our Discord that has an entire YouTube channel dedicated to the show? I don't remember. Okay, <laughs> I can probably find it real quick. But yeah, I think the Shroud of Turin is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus. And I think the wow. I think the best explanation for the image on it is that Jesus resurrects it. I think the physical chemical properties of the Shroud are suspiciously resurrection <laughs> He's taking my words. <laughs> I am taking. Are they your words, though? Are they? They're they're my words that I stole from a uh, from Apologetic Squared. Yeah. <laughs> but to be well, fair, that was a private conversation him and I had together. Well, that was public now. That 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 we were do that we were ha discussing some a priori arguments for a high prior probability of the resurrection of Jesus. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still think the Shroud of Turin is suspiciously resurrection. -y. I just haven't looked into it enough. Um, <laughs> I'm going to convince Dan. I would love to be convinced yeah, of the I'm Shroud. I would, but... Like I said, I, I, thought, I asked him starting for last about it, and I was surprised at the, as his, his, when he answered. He's like, yeah, there's probably good evidence that it's the real deal. And I was like, what? It's because, because it I, gets... It like it, he looked into it. Yeah, it gets portrayed as being a crackpot theory. Or like, oh, didn't you hear about the radiocarbon dating and stuff like that? Like, it gets portrayed as like this obvious fraud that's been debunked for like a billion years. But then you <laughs> actually look at the the research on it, and like, when I mean that, I mean like actual research or like peer review yeah. published stuff. And you're like, oh no, like none of these people bashing this thing on the internet internet have any clue what they're talking about. Like mm. they're just spouting stuff off. Yeah. And yeah, so I think it's really strong evidence. Um, all right, last question, and then. It's bedtime for me. I'm an old man. Um, me too. <coughs> advice on making a resurrection argument with someone within a five-minute span. Depends on who you ask. Um, if you ask a minimal facts guy, they'll probably give you these scholars agree on these facts, and these facts are the best ex like explanation of... I mean, the resurrection's the best explanation. Um, me being more of a maximalist, I'll probably say something along the lines of, like, look... Especially if it's like a, literally like I only have just a few minutes with a person, I'll be like, "Look, I have a lot of good reasons for thinking that the gospel, the New Testament in general, is is reliable, and that like the like the the way we should be looking at the gospels is as some kind of like a historical reportage, um, th where the <laughs> what's the wow for?" <laughs> Andy gone wild was like I was asking you. I'm not asking you. No. Yeah. He's like I'm not. I, know. I was like, wow. Um. So yeah. So long story short, um, the the writers of the New Testament when they're talking about Jesus are just trying to give an honest account, an accurate account of the historical Jesus, and that they were rely and that they were accurate. Um. Typically, from there, I would just kind of give like 
one or two undesigned coincidences, um, a few internal confirmations and, and a few external confirmations. I'd give um, some kind of a naming argument and probably just a brief, very brief outlook uh, argument on like traditional authorship and probably just do some like geographical argument. Um, not because I think that's the strongest one, but I think like when you're talking to the average person, that's going to typically like be something that hits a little bit more. At that point, you're probably like three minutes in. And from there, that's when I just actually start talking about the data that we can extract from the um, New Testament. So things like the fact that we had multiple um, eyewitnesses, the fact that women were the first ones to um, discover the tomb first, and that's embarrassing. Um, talk about the fact that, that the people, the, the disciples of Jesus and the first eyewitnesses um, were not only preaching something that they were anticipating. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh my gosh. Persecution for. Um, they, they were being persecuted for. So like that's a double edged sword because not only are you about, are you about to per, like preach a message that you know you'll be persecuted for, um, but you're also going to stay in that area and preach a message that you're going to, that you're, that you're actively being persecuted for as well. Um, which is completely unlike what other people, what other cult leaders do. Um, if you look at like the Jones, that like the Jonestown cult, they moved 2000 miles away to actually start their cult. Um, if you look at other cults, like they wait until later on. Hey, when are we going to see a do one second, Zach? Um, <laughs> Um, if you look at other cults, like they'll actually wait until longer or like later on until the people that don't care about what you're about to say will die off. So that way you can freely say what you want to say. Um, other things to consider would just be like um, the types of the eyewitness accounts, the fact that people ate with him, talked with him, touched him, spoke to him. Um, and um, I'm getting distracted so, like, the long story short is just pull, extracting all that data. At that point, you're five minutes in, and that's when I'm going to say something. Look, look, so here's the competing theories. I think that the resurrection of Jesus makes that more probable than not. Um, yeah, that's the five-minute case. Uh, okay, what your pastor didn't tell you. Uh, by the way, whoever's listening, if you're not sub to him, go sub to him, or I will um, I'll make videos that debunk Christianity. What um, <laughs> um, when are we going to see that dual response to Mike Winger? Um, both James and I are really busy. <laughs> um, That's a great question. I'm also interested to know when we'll when we'll see that response. Well, I don't. I'm super busy. I've been busy. I'm like, yeah. I so I'll say this. I'm 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 main I'm mainly interested in prepping for my debate with Dylan Hunty and getting content out to you guys, um, but also. I, it, I don't know that Mike is... I want to wait until Mike is done with his women in ministry stuff before I respond to anything. He's um, still working on it? Yeah. God. I think he said he was just... Uh, I think he said that he was just... In his 12-hour thing, he said he was going to make like, one say, more video talking out, about the practical hours. implications. He said he was going to make a video talking about the practical implications of that one on First Timothy. So I will say that when it comes to... Um, when it comes to Mike William or Mike Winger, there's a website that has done some good um, has done some good stuff responding to them. Let me find it real quick. They've done they have several they have some scholars um, who have done some systematic like responses to uh, Mike Winger's stuff. And I would say until if you're if you're just like you see a Mike Winger video and you're like I'm really <coughs> hankering to see an answer to that. Um, I was gonna give it. I was gonna find the the reference for it because um, I don't remember how to how to spell it. You good, Matt? If you're tired, you can head out too. Yeah, I gotta run. Nothing's keeping you here, bro. Um, yeah, it's uh, TarynWilliams.com. Thank you. They have uh, they've been doing some stuff. Say what, Matt? Give James my number so I can help him out with social media. I'll just start a. I'll start a group chat. Sounds good. All right, guys. All right. Love you, bro. Peace. It was nice meeting you, man. James. Take care. I enjoyed it. Later. Yeah. So, yeah, for people who are hankering to see responses to my, it'll probably be a while because before me and Thane can do it because Thane has some stuff that it's just more important for him to prioritize. And I've been, 
I haven't, since I put my video out, I haven't done any more <coughs> prepping for that just because I've been focused on other projects. Um, so I would say check out uh, TarynWilliams.com. They have some really good academic responses to, to pretty much every video that, uh, or, or a, a significant portion of the videos that Mike has put out to this, huh. to this point. All right. Two last questions. James, did Winger respond to your video at all? Do you know if he watched it? I don't know if Winger watched it. He never responded to it. But I, I mean, I checked his channel and I didn't see anything responding to it. Um, so he never responded to me. I have no clue if he's seen it or not. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, let me just get rid of... Oh, never mind. Um, okay, and the last one. Um, <coughs> speaking of Matt Dillahunty, what are your thoughts on the whole claims are not evidence? I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, we'll answer that question when Tim McGrew comes on my channel and we um, record together to talk about epistemology of testimony. Um, so you'll have to wait till that to get like a really in-depth thing because my voice is also getting shot now. And man, Parker... Um, Listen, man, I love you, and because of that, James and I are gonna stay on for another two hours, and <laughs> and and You're we'll. My life real quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, bro. Thanks for stopping by. I love you. Um, in chat for anybody not sub to Parker, go sub to him, or I'll be an atheist. Um. All right, guys. That's not the type of conditionalism I I thought you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. James, thanks for hopping on again. Everybody go sub to James. Um, My name is in Philosopher's Garb since it's not in the, in the title. Or in, is it in the description? They, no, they, the description. <laughs> I don't even have a description for this. Dan <laughs> um, <laughs> phoned this in, but he's like, whatever. Descriptions don't matter. People don't read those. I'm just with that. Yeah, it's for a gaming stream. I'm just like, man. It's <laughs> pretty self-explanatory what's going on here. Yeah. Yo! Oh, Parker, congrats. Let's go. Dude. Congrats, bro. Dude. Keep it keep me updated, okay? And I'll be praying for you. All right. That's really exciting. Um <laughs> what James means by other projects is responding to McClellan videos. <laughs> That's funny. I'm not gonna get started on that rabbit hole. I'm tired. Um Thank you, everybody, for listening. Go sub to Inspire in uh in I almost called you Inspire Philosophy. <laughs> in Philosopher's Garb. Um Go follow him on TikTok and all that jazz and go support him um, and all my friends. I love all my friends. If you don't support my friends, I won't support you. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> thanks, everybody. God bless.